Okay, so circles. Let's try and think about um, what an equation for circles would look like. So, of course, if we draw a terrible circle, it's, okay, that's about as good as I can get. Okay, so here is a circle. Uh, the main characteristic of a circle, of course, is that it's all the points that are the same distance away from the center of the circle. So if we think of the center of the circle, just to start off with, as a point on the origin of a Cartesian coordinate system. So here we have the, the y-axis, the x-axis, and pretend those are all in a nice straight line, x and y. Then all the points, let's use, I don't know, how about some green, some little green. Any point on here is a little point, um, well, I could use x and y, but maybe that's a little overdone. Say a comma b. Any point on the circle is going to be an ordered pair a comma b, such that, come on, come on there, such that this is the value a, um, and then coming across this way, um, this is the height b. So then if we think about creating this little triangle that starts at the origin, coming out to there, this is the radius of the circle, r. Uh, this height right there is b, and this value there is a, right, since we're starting at the origin. And so we create a nice right triangle. Once again, little Pythagorean theorem says that it must be true that a squared plus b squared must be equal to r squared. Good. And so the r is a constant that's true for a circle. So if we let r equal some constant, um, say r equals a constant, equals a constant, uh, then we arrive at something that's the equation of a circle. Now, I let uh, the point on the circle be the value or, or, or be represented by the points a comma b, uh, but traditionally we like to use x and y, it's just that we use it too much I think, but uh, we can either leave it like this or we can write it in general form as some form x squared plus y squared equals to r squared. Any questions on this here? No? No? So this is the equation centered at zero. Um, and then if we move it around, if we have a circle centered someplace else, so let's say we have another circle over here, um, and maybe it's centered not on the origin, but maybe like to the side of it, like this. Here's the x-axis, here's the y-axis, and this thing is centered somewhere, like let's say that this is the value h and this is the value k so that this point right there is the point h comma k but we still have some radius some radius r to the edge well it's r all the way around so we can either draw it like there or we can draw the radius say like there, same thing, or we can draw the radius um, you know, coming down, right? So the radius is always going to be the same in either direction. Uh, so all we have to do is readjust the values of x, right? So a point here is going to be in um, some, some ordered pair x comma y, let's say. Don't confuse it with the x-axis and the y-axis, just some point x comma y. Then this is going to be x, but then this distance along here ends up being x minus h. Good. So we just have to readjust for where the new origin is to find out the, the, the value on the horizontal axis. So if, maybe this was a bad place to put the r, let's 
let's rewrite this over here. Oh wow, that's way too much erasing. It's just, it's just this part here. And this part there, and this part there. Okay, so if my point was up there, so then that would be x comma y, and then I'd have my triangle that I form like this, then coming down here, this would be my x, and this little gap right in here would then be x minus h. Um, and then if I go in this direction, then this little gap here would be y minus k. And now the same property of x minus h squared, x minus h squared um, plus y minus k squared would still be equal to the r squared, right, since this is my radius, r squared. So it doesn't really matter where the circle is centered, we can always come up with an equation for it. So this is the more formal presentation of the equation of a circle. So the equation of a circle centered at h comma k with radius r is given by x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. Um, and in more, uh, a more common setting is for it to be centered at zero, comma zero, the origin of a rectangular coordinate system. So that would be this other uh, more generic formula for it where h and k are equal to zero. Right, if we replace the h and the k with a zero, that's how we get this equation. Any questions, questions, questions? Um, a great free online calculator for this is Desmos. It does a good job of demonstrating a lot of this stuff. So you're welcome to use it. Why am I Googling it? I'm on Google it. Desmos.com. Then you go to the graphing calculator. Okay, so let's do, uh, for example, a circle. It's just um, a circle x to the power of 2 plus y to the power of 2 equals 3. Well, let's say it equals 9. So here we have a circle centered at the origin, right? Here's our formula. Uh, for it and the radius is 3 because this is following um, the, the case where we have r equals to 3, 3 squared is 9. Good. Uh, but now let's let uh, let's let, let's change these to sort of slider values here see if this is going to let me do it. Uh -oh. Oh, great. Now it's not giving me trouble. I'm not sure why it doesn't like it when I square the R. have one set up. Let's Google Desmo circles. Desmos circles. That's what I was trying to do. All right, well, they have it squared here. I'm not sure why when I was doing it, it wasn't letting me. Uh, but at any rate, uh, so here's the general form of that circle equation. We can just play around with it. Remember, 
x is the input variable along the horizontal axes, y is the vertical variable, and a, uh, h and k are constants that represent the center of the circle. So if we just move this over to zero, let's put this over to zero, whoops, come on. zero and move this over to zero. So here is um, the, the circle centered at zero, zero. And as we uh, move the value of R, we see that the value of R determines the radius of the circle. So it gets bigger, smaller, bigger, and smaller. Of course, R uh, has to be a value of zero or greater. It doesn't make sense conceptually to think of a negative radius circle, right? Okay, and then as we move the, the k value here, then it changes the value of the, or the location of the circle, sort of in the up and down. Right? As this input value here changes, then uh, it, it moves it up and down. And then as h changes, then it'll change the circle left and right. Any questions? No? No? Mm -hmm. OK, let's look at uh, another example from over here. So moving on. Find the equation of the circle of the radius 3 and centered at 2 comma negative 5. So this is a straightforward application of our formula. Remember, our formula is h x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. Uh, so we want a radius of 3, so that pushes this guy to be a 3, so that should be 3 squared because it's a radius of 3. And then it's centered at uh, a 2 comma negative 5, so that means that this is the that means that this is the h value and this is the k value, right? And then this is the r value. Uh, so this will be our formula will be x minus 2 squared plus y minus, now be careful because the k has its own value of negative 5, so it's y minus negative 5 in parentheses, squared. So then it simplifies to x minus 2 squared plus y plus 5 squared equals to 9. Oh, that's really ugly. Okay, you get the point. Good. And then going back to our Desmos equation, so this is r value of 3 and 2 negative 5. r value of 3 gets us there, and then 2 is over here, 2, come on. Ah. Yeah. two. and then negative 5. There. So, whoa. here is our circle. Good. Questions, 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 and h comma k labeled. And there's our circle, two comma negative five. Any questions? No, no. Okay, so here's what the author did. Same thing, plugged it in. Same answer. Nice, same, same kind of graph. Find the equation of a circle that has the point uh, 1 comma 8 and 5 comma negative uh, 6 as the endpoints of the diameter. Okay, so um, roughly this is in quadrant 1, 1 comma 8, and this is going to be in quadrant 2 since it's 5 comma negative 6. So we have I don't know, some point over here and some point over here somewhere point P, this is point Q, and they are, well, I should have done the circle first. One my lesson. Anyway, we're going to pretend that's a circle. Wow, that's a really ugly circle. 
any rate, uh, okay, so it's a diameter, so it goes through the origin. Oh, wow, okay, I gotta, I gotta reduce, I gotta start with a circle, go away. Okay, so clearly I gotta start with a circle. Still pretty ugly, but a little less ugly, I guess. Just gonna erase the whole. Ah, uh, I thought so. Okay, whatever. So pretend that little part there is not there. Uh, okay, so we have something that goes across, and we have point P over here, which is uh, one comma eight, and point Q somewhere on the other side, which is. 5 comma negative 6. So we need to find the center, right? Since it's a diameter, then it goes through the, the center of this guy. So we can find the value h comma k, which is the center of the of the of the radius uh, of this thing. And then from there we can figure out the radius of the circle, right? Because we need to figure out how how big is this thing? We need to figure out that. That's going to be the radius. So if, as long as we have um, the center of, of, our, of our circle and we have the radius, then we can figure out the equation uh, of the circle. Okay, uh, so let's find that, that value by using our midpoint uh, formula. And the midpoint formula was really just to find the average of the x's and the average of the y's from before. So midpoint. It's going to be equal to 5 plus 1 divided by 2, comma, 8 plus negative 6 divided by 2. So that's going to be 6 over 2 and negative 2, or positive 2 over 2, which just gives us 3 and 1. So that's the midpoint here. So that gives us the h comma k value. Okay, um, and then to find the distance between any two points, we need to find the value of r. Well, now that we have the midpoint, to find the distance between any two points, we use the distance formula. And the distance formula is just to subtract the uh, x's, square them, plus subtract the y's, square them, and that equals to the, the, oops, that gives us what we need, so we need another page here. So remember that for our distance. So let's say we have the h comma k value is equal to three comma one, and we have this other point q. Let's just use point p. Why not? We have slightly better values. I don't know. Point p. So let's find the distance between uh, the center and point p of one comma eight. P which equals to one comma eight. So the distance between the center and point P, right, this is the center, uh, is equal to the square root of, it's going to be uh, 3 minus 1 squared plus 1 minus 8 squared, and then square root of that whole thing. Gives us 2 squared, which is 4, 2 squared plus negative 7 squared, and then the square root of that whole thing. So 4 plus 49 square rooted, which gives us square root of 53. Good. So that's the, the distance, so that means that r is going to be equal to this r is equal to the distance between the center and point p. 
So we have everything we need to create the equation of the circle. We have that the center center equals to 3 comma 1 and we have that r equals root 53 so our general formula is going to be x minus 3 squared plus y minus 1 squared equals to square root of 53 squared which is just going to be 53 so x minus 3 squared plus y minus 1 squared equals to 53. Any questions? Let's see if this is the way the author did it. There's always more than one way to do things. So, uh, radius squared, okay, yeah, same thing, 53, same answer. Okay, any questions at all? Here's a better picture of my sad circle, better version of my sad circle. No questions, no questions? No, 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 no. Okay, so that's the end of chapter seven, section nine. Let's move on to uh, 10. 10 is pretty easy, we'll get through it quickly. It's all about lines. Okay, chapter one, section 10, lines. In this section, we're gonna look at the slope of a line, the point slope form of equations of a line, slope intercept form of equations of a line, the vertical and horizontal uh, equations of lines, general equations of line, and then parallel and perpendicular lines, kind of a couple of special cases that kind of come up a lot. Okay, slope of a line. Slope of a line is a way for us to describe the steepness of a line. How steep is a line? And in a way, it's a little arbitrary. We just kind of settled on this, this description. It's not the only way to describe the steepness of a line. Uh, we can also, uh, another popular way to go is to think about the angles form. That's another way to describe the steepness of a line. But slope uh, is another way. And we settled on this definition. You know, there's, there's, there's some things in math that we don't really control. We, we discover them. This is the way the universe works. There's no way around it. Uh, like, for example, the value of pi. It's important that this is how we can find, uh, we can establish the relationship between the circumference of a circle and its diameter, and it comes to pi. Pi is the universe created pi. We didn't create it. We just discovered it, identified it, and we use it. Uh, but there's certain things that we do definitely just kind of create uh, and just go with it. And it doesn't have to be, a, a, you know, in this way. But it's just something we kind of agreed on, uh, and it works fine as long as we're all consistent about the definition. So slope is defined as the rise over run, right? It doesn't have to be that way. We could have defined it the other way around. Um, and there is actually a little area of math where they do want you to do it the other way around and it gets really confusing uh, to do it the other way around. But anyway, I don't even want to repeat it because then it starts to get confusing. So at any rate, uh, for, for almost all the time, slope is rise over run, rise over run. Okay, so if we have uh, this red line over here, for example, uh, we want to think about it uh, from left to right, the way we read, from left to right, left to right. If you're going uphill, like this little climber here, if you're going uphill, uh, we're going to have a positive rise over a positive uh, change in the x direction. So we describe this to be a positive uh, slope. If, on the other hand, from left to right, the way we read, you would be going downhill on this line, we consider that to be a negative slope. And that's because the change in the x direction from here to here, right, uh, from left to right, the way we read, 
that still remains positive, but now you would be going down, so the, the y part would be uh, negative, the rise would be negative. So this is an example of a negative slope. Okay, so rise over run is, is the most common uh, description of, of, of slope. Uh, there's a couple of others as we'll see, right? We can also define it this way. I'm sure this is a popular equation probably everyone has seen and memorized at this point. So the slope M of a non-vertical line that passes through the points A and B, defined by X sub 1, Y sub 1, and uh, X sub 2, Y sub 2, is described this way. Usually we like to use the letter M to represent slope, rise over run, as we covered. Uh, and now what we could do is think about this formula. Now, where does this formula come from? Well, we'll see a nice little, uh, well, okay, just draw a quick little thing here. So if we have on the Cartesian coordinate plane some value a there, uh, where a equals to x sub 1, y sub 1, uh, and then we have some other random points, I don't know, say here, I'm trying to put it there, some other point over there, uh, b, which is equal to x sub 2 comma y sub 2. Then we think about the line that connects them. Okay. Um, then the rise over run. So again, we're going to create this little triangle. And again, we run into the Pythagorean triangle, which is a nice, pretty little right triangle like this. So on the Cartesian coordinate system, then this distance here would be x sub 2 minus x sub 1. And then this distance here would be y sub 2 minus y sub 1. Good. That's, you know, if it's on some, some uh, rectangular coordinate system, like let's say that that whole thing is on this grid over here where this is y and this is x, then this value here traces to x sub 2, and this value here traces down to x sub 1. So the distance between them is x sub 2 minus x sub 1. And then same thing over here. This point traces over here to give you a y sub 1, and this point up there traces over here to give you a y sub 2. So this gap here, the distance there, is y sub 2 minus y sub 1. Right? The, the distance here matches. The, y, the one in the y is the one that's most uh, difficult to see, I think. Um, so this distance here, if I got a measuring tape and measured it here from there to there, would be y sub 2 minus y sub 1. And that matches up with this distance over here, which is y sub 2 minus y sub 1. And then same thing in this direction. If I think about this gap right here, it is this matches up with this down here. Anyway, okay, so um, if we, we want to do the, the, uh, the slope is defined to be the change in the y direction. That's another way of describing it. We can describe this as delta y. This little triangle here, we, we describe it as delta, delta, and it represents change in math, change. So it equals the change in the y, this is the change in the y, and then this is the delta x, the change in the x direction. So that's another way to describe slope, delta y over delta x. The change in the x-axis divided by the change in, I'm sorry, the change in the y-axis divided by the change in the x-axis. Good. We've all seen this many times before, right? Any questions? Good, 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 good. Maybe, maybe. So like I said, uh, this is a little arbitrary in our definition, rise over run. There's no reason, no logical reason why it has to be this way. It's just it makes sense. There are other ways to describe the steepness of the line, but this is one such way. And as long as we're all doing it in the same way, then we're consistent about it. 
So here we have a line and we have several points on the line. Here's four separate points on the line. Uh, so the a great property of slope is that whenever you grab any two points, no matter how close they are together or how far apart they are together, it doesn't matter, as long as they are points on the line, you grab any two points and you create this little triangle underneath it and you find the change in the y and the change in the x by subtracting them. Now, if you can actually tell which one is the bigger one, of course, you grab the biggest one and subtract by the smallest one to make sure it's a positive distance. If not, we have to be, um, um, well, in this case here, uh, it's a positive um, slope, so we know that when we subtract these two, we're going to get a positive answer. And when we subtract these two in this order, we're going to get a positive answer. Uh, however, when we are just working with ordered pairs given to you, we might not be certain on which one is the bigger number, which was the smaller number. So you should always confirm that your final answer matches in terms of the sign if you're expecting it to be a positive a slope versus a negative slope. That's what I was trying to say. Anyway, um, okay, so just in general, we have positive slopes are this way remember a little stick person walking on it from left to right the way we read if he's going uphill we have a positive slope if he's going downhill we have a negative slope uh, if it's flat like this there is no rise there is no uh, not going up not going down flat horizontal then we have zero slope and then this is kind of a, a unique situation and that's where there is no slope at all vertical lines do not have a slope and um, the general forms of linear equations that we're going to see soon uh, do, not do not fit this form. This is a unique situation. Vertical lines are always a unique situation um, um, that don't apply with the regular, the regular equations for lines. Good. Can you say that's undefined? The, no slope no? the the slope itself is undefined, but the actual equation is not undefined. So okay, yeah. So let's put that on here. It's a great point. So the the no slope. So the slope is undefined. Slope slope equals undefined. Um, and then the the equation of the line is going to take the form of x equals some number. Right? And then that gets confusing because context is everything. If I told you, when, once we see some of these things, x equals some constant. Some constant. Um, where that constant is going to be the value on the x-axis here. So we'll see, we'll see what this is in a second. But they're kind of a unique, unique case. So the, the line is not undefined, but the slope is undefined. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay, so find the slope of the line that passes through this point. Okay, easy questions. So here, uh, I would recommend that we begin by defining our points as x1, y1, and then x2, and y2. Just, just in general, we can kind of get a sense of where this line should be. Uh, it should be in quadrant one, so that's going to be just sort of in general. This is two units, one unit, I don't know, something like there. And then eight units this way, so this is a two there, and this is a one here. Uh, and then this goes all the way out to eight. And then this goes up to five. Say there, and then that's five. Okay, so I'm looking at this. I'm expecting a positive slope. Okay, and then I can just apply it to my formula. Y equals to Y sub two minus Y sub one over X sub two minus X sub one. Right, so I want the change in the Y's divided by the change in the X's. So I can tell from here that the change is going to be a 4, and the change here is going to be a, um, a 6. Right, so that's easy. This is a 4, and this is a 6. 
Okay, so when I plug it in here, I should be getting something like that. Now, um, okay, so let me plug that in here. So I get uh, y sub 2, that's going to be 5 minus 1 all over uh, x sub 2, that would be 8 minus 2, which ends up giving me 4 over 6, just like I thought. So rise over run is 4 over 2, which reduces to 2 thirds. Now, the thing I was trying to say earlier, I'm not sure if I said it right. Um, so uh, if you don't do this visual over here, you really don't have any sense of where these are and, and maybe not really super clear whether your slope should be positive or negative. Uh, so sometimes you'll end up with a negative uh, here, but uh, um, if you follow the math, it'll still give you the correct answer. So my point was this, how about if somebody decides to label these the other way around? So if P is this and Q is 8 comma 5. So let's say somebody decides to label this one as point number 2 or this one as Y number 2, right? Or maybe the word problem just gives them to you differently, like literally write them down this one first and this one second. Um, so that shouldn't make a difference. So let's say that someone thinks this is going to be x sub 1 and this one's going to be y sub 1. Okay, so now when we plug them into here, you'll end up with m equals to y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. And then y sub 2 is a 1 minus a 5. Right? And then just looking at that, you're like, oh, wait, I'm going to get a negative 4. It's supposed to be positive. Well, luckily, in the denominator, if you follow uh, the process, we end up with 1 minus 8, which, whoops, what did I do? 1 minus 5. Okay, uh, so then you end up with a 2 minus 8, which gives you a minus 6. So negative over negative reduces to just a positive 2 over 3. So you still get the same answer. You just have to be consistent about how you evaluate your, your slope. Any questions? No? 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 Okay. Um... What is this thing here? Oh, I know what happened. Uh, this thing got messed up. Okay. Uh, okay, anyway, this is the way the author solved it, which is the same answer we got. And here's a nice little drawing of it. Uh, you know, if if the original question was just presented this way, uh, which sometimes happens, uh, this comes with the benefit of a nice grid system. So sometimes you can just count squares, right? If they ask you to find the slope of this line, uh, then you could just count squares. And we have to count uh, one, two, three, four, five, six in this direction, and then uh, one, two, three, four in this direction. So we have four squares over six squares. That's how we know that it's going to be a slope of four over six. Um, and then again, once again, just take a, just match to make sure that the sign makes sense. Uh, so if this was, was presented to you, you know that you are expecting a positive slope because a little stick person here walking from left to right, the way we read, would be going uphill. So we know it's positive slope. Good. Any questions? Okay. Easy stuff. Uh, so now equations of lines. Uh, equations of lines come in three general forms. The first form is the point slope form of the equation of a line. And this one is really just exactly derived from the equation of slope, right? Slope was equal to y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1, like this, right? So if we just multiply both sides of the equal sign by this denominator, 
we just decide to multiply this side by x sub 2 minus x sub 1 and then multiply this side by x sub 2 minus x sub 1 then on the right hand side these guys cancel and you're just left with this x sub 2 minus x sub 1 times m equals to y sub 2 minus y sub 1 Good. okay so now if we just flip them around right kind of use this as a little hinge and flip it around as y sub 2 minus y sub 1 is equal to m times x sub 2 minus x sub 1 right everyone's okay with me doing that right I'm not really subtracting both sides and doing anything all I'm doing is I'm just flipping around this reading it in reverse and then here we know that with multiplication the order doesn't matter so I can put this one first and this one second and that's how we get to this equation right here the only difference is that here we have little subscripts on the x's and the y's and, and both the x's and the y's uh, whereas here we drop the subscripts so the difference being that when we were working with the slope formula over here we were under the assumption right like over here when it was presented it's gone too far over here where it was presented this was assuming that we knew the value of uh, two different points now this is too messy really um, when we have um, known known points point A which is x1 comma y1 and B which is x2 comma y2 and you want to find find M well these two things are known we know this one we know that one we know all these little values and we're looking for M that's when we use this formula M equals 2 and then we plug in the known values into our equation Oops. Okay. on the other hand hmm, uh, when we know M and one point say a equal to x sub 1 comma y sub 1 then we can use this formula where this value is known and this value is known and this value is known and then this is the the variables that are unknown right so the any other point that can fit into this equation that makes sense Good. So we just drop the little subscript 2's and leave that as the unknown uh, value of x and y, and that's how we get to this equation. Does that make sense? So if you know the, the actual ordered pair values and you need to find m, use this formula. If you know m and one point, then you can use this formula to find the equation of the line where we know the m and we know the x sub 1, y sub 1, so the only unknown values are y and x with no subscripts, and those become your new variables. The variable of the other point um, on the line that makes, makes the statement true. Okay, let's apply it to something. Find the equation on the line through point 1, comma, negative 3, and slope negative 2, uh, of negative 1 half. All right, so again, we just apply that uh, that formula. We have y minus y sub 1 is equal to m times x minus x sub 1. So since we have one point, we know one point, we can label this one as the known point x1 and the known point y1, and they gave us m. So this is a really easy, straightforward substitution here where that guy is uh, a one half, this guy's gonna be a one, and this guy's gonna be uh, a negative three. So just fill in the rest, y minus, be careful that this minus comes from there, and the y sub one had its own minus, so we'll simplify it afterwards. The m was given x minus one. 
So once we apply it all in there, then we just simplify it as much as we can. That turns into that equals to negative one half times x minus one. This would be a perfectly good way to describe the equation of a line, and we're done there. Or, uh, or if you want to rewrite it into a different form of a linear equation, uh, like the slope-intercept form, which we're about to do, then you can move forward and simplify it. And your next step to do that would be to distribute this negative one half and move the minus three, solve for y, and then you get to that other point. Any questions right now? Uh, a sketch, a rough sketch. Well, okay, um, you know, we're not looking for a great, great graph, just a rough sketch. So I know one point on the line is the point 1, comma, negative 3. That's going to be in quadrant 4, since we go across 1, down 3. So here is my y-axis, and here is my x-axis. Uh, so 1 and negative 3, let's say negative 3 is over there. So I definitely know one point on the line. Oh, that's fine. It's pretty good. There's 1, negative 3. And then the slope. I can use slope as rise over run to give me a rough sketch of what this thing is going to look like. Remember, this is, uh, well, actually, let's first of all deal with this minus. So M. Oh, no. Uh, m equals to negative one half. So I'm going to put the little minus up in the numerator, right? It doesn't matter whether you put it in the numerator or the denominator. Just as a uh, as a habit, I like to put it up in the numerator. Um, so then that's going to be the rise, and this is going to be the run. Rise over run is the slope, and I already have one point that's definitely on the line. So I know that if I go out two units, two units as my run, right, run is along the x-axis. This is delta x over delta y, uh, delta y over delta x, sorry. Um, and now the run is positive 2, but the, uh, the rise is negative 1, so I know it's going to go down by 1 this way. Negative 1 equals the rise is the delta y, this is the delta x. So this little triangle helps me arrive at another point that's definitely on the line. So that helps me establish a rough sketch of what this line is going to look like. Good. I can continue to create more little triangle guys if I wanted to find more points. I can go again this way and do another two points that way, another one, negative one this way, two that way, negative one this way. Or I can go this way since I can, I can see the pattern. I know I'm going to go this way. It's going to be negative one this way, two that way. And so I can find all the points I need on this line until I eventually run into the the y-axis, right? But unless the y-axis is a nice whole number, um, uh, we, we, oopsie, and in fact, my scale is way off here because this is supposed to be a one, and I just went two units this way, and I haven't even crossed the, the, the y-axis, so this is a really ugly graph, or a really ugly picture, but you get my point. Good? Questions, questions, questions? No? So, okay. Um, let's do a better graph than my ugly graph. Uh, so let's see, we plug it in to our equations. What is this? Using the point slope form. There, so that, that looks better. So one comma three, we go out two units this way, one unit this way. And now, uh, if we wanted to find more, we can again go from here to here, and that's going to be a minus 1. And then we can go across this way, and then that would be two units. So we can get to another point that's definitely on the line. So this is kind of like what I was doing, but much better pictures. So this going to be two units down, so we can come up with another point here. So let's, come, let's write down the ordered pairs. 
um, the the x used to be at a, a value of 1 and then I went out two units this way so this should be negative 1 and then it used to be down at a height of um, negative 3 but then there's a change of, of negative 1 so this should be the point negative 1 comma negative 2 right in there uh, and then over here, uh, we were at a 1, and we go out across to 3, so this should be the point 3, comma, negative 4, where we used to be at a, a y value of negative 3, down by 1, gets you to negative 4. And we can just keep going, keep going, keep going. But notice how this process made it really difficult, makes it really challenging to figure out where is the y-intercept point because right, it's not a whole number solution. So it doesn't solve that very nicely, not, not graphically like this. Any questions? Um, if, will that be allowed on the test? Like, uh-oh, I forgot the equation. Let me just, you know. Like, what, what will be allowed? The picture? Yeah, like the picture, like, I know because on some teachers that I've had, it's like, nope, you got to do it by, like, by the books. It's like. Well, it's. I mean, I know um, this is, like, very specific to just that. But I mean, sure. Um, my thinking is that it, it's all important. So there are some situations where you can you can only solve it in one way and there are some situations where you can solve it in lots of different ways uh, so I think it's valuable to have the ability to solve it in different ways and I'm okay with um, you know um, you know sometimes I very specifically want to see a particular skill so I might say for this question you have to use the quadratic formula I want to see how you use it or for this question, I want you to graph it and find find the graphical solution for it or something. Um, so there's different skills that I'm kind of pointing at, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's it's nice to be able to have a variety of skills and be able to attack a, a question from uh, multiple angles. Um, so more directly to your question, there are some questions that will be presented to you where the very best way to solve it is to do it this way like it's it's not just uh, that you're kind of allowed to do it this way it's like this is the way to solve it so if um, you know before I mess this whole thing up or got it all muddied up um, for example you know one question I could give you is something incredibly bare like here is the y-axis here is the x-axis and um, I might just say find the equation of this line like this and then maybe just give you a point there that says, you know, this is the point 1 comma negative 2, and here is the point, um, I don't know, 5 comma 4, like that. And I say find the equation of this blue line. Well, the best thing you could do is to just count squares, right, uh, assuming that it's a grid, like, like this one, the nice grid system. You can just count squares to figure out what is the run, what is the rise. Uh, and figure out your slope that way um, and then use any one of these points to plug it into our formula and there you have your equation in your line uh, so it, it's it's nice to be able to connect it to the picture okay. good uh, now specifically about your test um, I will follow the wording of the homework as well. Your test should be very, very similar to the kind of work you do in your homework. So as you're doing your homework, just pay attention to the style of the question, what they're asking you to do, how it's presented, and that's what you can expect on a test. Um, what yeah. would the test be? Mm, that's a good point. Um, so first of all, uh, we're going to have to have an extra day at some point because I was, um, you know, to make up for Monday. So um, I think I'm going to have uh, a class again on on Friday instead of Monday so to make up for Monday. And I know some of you can't make it on Friday, but, you know, that's okay. These are all being recorded and I'll post it up 
online. Um, so I'm thinking probably early next week is going to have to be our first test. Um, I'll, I'll, it depends a little bit on how we get through the next couple of sections, but um, I'm thinking maybe Monday or Tuesday should be our first test. Okay. Um, and it'll, it'll cover up to wherever we uh, finish up this week, um, which will probably be through Chapter 2. Today's Tuesday, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, slope-intercept form of the linear equation. All right, so another way of describing a line is through this other method, the slope-intercept form of a linear equation, uh, which is described this way, y equals mx plus b. This is true. Th this can be applied to non-vertical lines. Remember, like I said, the ones that are vertical kind of follow their own thing, which we'll look at in a little bit. Uh, but uh, for any non-vertical lines, we can have uh, we can express the equation of the line in the slope-intercept form, where uh, the m is the slope of the line, and zero comma b is the y-intercept. So we use the b in the zero comma b to be the number, the value that goes there for the slope-intercept form of the linear equation. Okay. Now, this does not mean that there's two different things out there. Um, they're all connected to each other. They're all associated with each other. So we can easily take this, which was in the um, um, a slope point form of the linear equation, and if we move things around, distribute, combine like terms, we can solve for y and put it into uh, this, this other form of the linear equation. So here with this first example, we'll go back and forth between them. Okay, so um, okay, we already covered this. The equation of a line has a slope m, y-intercept 0, comma b. So find the equation of a line that has slope of 3 and has a y-intercept of negative 2. So that's just a straightforward application of y equals mx plus b, where the m is a 3, so y equals to 3x, and then the y-intercept, oh, this bugged me, y-intercept, why would they say 2? That doesn't make sense. Uh, a y-intercept is an ordered pair, so it should say 0 comma negative 2, not intercept of negative 2, that doesn't make sense. Anyway. Uh, so we want that b value, right? So that means that that guy is the b. So plus the b, which is negative 2. So we can just simplify this as y equals to 3x minus 2. Good. Questions, questions, questions? No? Okay. okay. So we could have, we, uh, we, we were able to just plug it in directly. Uh, but notice that if we didn't know this form of a linear equation, we only had the other form. The other form was the point-slope form. Remember, the other, the other form is y minus y1 equals to m times x minus x1. Okay, so we know that the slope is a 3. And we know that uh, we know this point, 0 comma negative 2. So if we had uh, 0 comma negative 2, we could think of this as x sub 1 and then this one as y sub 1. So we plug it into here as negative 2 and a 0. x minus 0 and then equals and then y minus negative 2. Okay, and then we simplify and get y plus 2 equals to 3x minus 0. Well, that minus 0 doesn't really do anything, so we end up with y equals y plus 2 equals to 3x. And then if we subtract uh, 2 from both sides, we get that y equals to 3x minus 2. Right, if we subtract 2. And so we arrive at the exact same formula. Right, this is exactly that which means that this is also exactly equal to this guy or that guy, right? They're all equal to each other. There's different ways of expressing a linear equation. Good. So you can use algebra 
to manipulate one form of a linear equation into another form of a linear equation. And there's different reasons why you'd want to do that. Sometimes it just, it, depending on what you're working with, sometimes one form is easier than another form. Any questions? Okay, so there's the application of it. Um, find the slope and the y-intercept of the line 3y minus 2x equals to 1. Okay, so this is not in either form the way it's written. This does not fit the form of um, the point slope form of y, oh, oops, y minus y1 equals mx minus x1. This doesn't fit that exactly. And this doesn't fit y equals mx plus b either, right? Doesn't fit that either. So when we want to uh, find the slope and the y-intercept, the easiest, one of the easiest things we could do is just solve for y, make it fit this form. And once I've made it fit this form, I can just read my information because I know that this is the slope. And I know that from here, 0 comma b is the y-intercept. Okay, so let's just put it in that form. We use our awesome algebra skills to solve for y. We begin by adding 2x to both sides. 2x plus 2x. And we get 3y equals to 2x plus 1. Divide everything by 3. And we end up with y equals to 2 thirds x plus 1 third. 1 third. And now this fits the form of y equals some number x plus some number. Here it is. So because of that, I know that this must be the m. This must be the slope. And this is the value b. So to answer my question, the y-intercept is going to be the point 0, comma, uh, well, I'll just put it over here, uh, y-intercept, y-intercept must be the value 0, comma, 1 third. Don't forget about the putting it into the ordered pair form because it's a point on a grid, not just 1 third. 1 third is b, but 0, comma, 1 third is the y-intercept. And the slope is positive two thirds. Any questions? Maybe, sort of, kind of, maybe, maybe, maybe. What if now I wanted to put it into the into this form, the point slope form? What if you know I, here is uh, an equation of a line? Uh, I rewrote it and put it into the slope-intercept form. Now I want to write it in this form. Okay, the things I need, I need the slope, which I just found, and I need one more point. So I can use this point. Here it is, right? Or I can use some other point. It doesn't matter. Uh, so let's go out and try and find another point. Um, so looking at this equation right here, um, let's see, what would be a good choice for uh, for x, if I let x equal zero, of course it gives you a zero for this term, right? So if I'm looking at a y equals to two thirds blank plus one third, okay. Um, if I put a zero there, of course this goes away, and I get the ordered pair zero comma one third, which we already have is this right here. If I put this as a one, we get two thirds plus one third, which equals to three over three, which gives me a one. So that makes sense. It seems like a good choice, right? If we let x equal to one, then we end up with y also equaling to two over three plus one over three, which is equal to three over three, which equals one. So we get the ordered pair one comma one. 
I can use that to plug it into this and get another way, another description of the line. I can let this be y minus 1 from here. This is x1 and y1 for my purposes of fitting it into this form equals 2 and then the slope is 2 thirds 2 thirds and then x minus 1 this equation is the exact same equation as this one and I can also use this other point right I, I just went out uh, you know I went through the trouble of finding one more point so that I can uh, put it in here uh, but also I could have used this this value in here and then that also would have given me another version of the line y minus one third equals to two thirds x minus zero there's another equation of the exact same line any questions so there's really an infinite number of ways to come up with equations that describe the exact same line. Um, yeah. You kind of lost me at one for a, like y equal the equation at the very bottom right corner. Mm -hmm. Y equals two thirds plus one third. Blah 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 equals one. Why did yeah. you choose one again? Are you trying to match it? I was just simply using sort of a table uh, table style format here to come up with more solutions to it. So let's come up with some more space here. I was doing this. Once we have uh, an equation of the form two thirds, one third. So we have y equals to two thirds x plus one third. If I want to find more solutions to this, more ordered pairs that belong on this line, then what you could do is think of it as a oh. table. Are you just finding like more points? You yes. Just kind of like, okay. That's all, all right. I was doing. So let okay. x go there. So I was like, okay, let x equal one. And I plugged in a one there. I was just doing it in a messy way. Uh, two thirds, and then there's a one plus one third. I got that y equals to three over three, which is a one. And then that's how I was able to get the point one comma one. The reason I did that is because I was trying to come up with another way to describe that line using this formula. And for this formula, you need the slope, which we have. We figured out that the slope was the point on the line. We already had one point. We had this point. But why not do other points? Right. So that's why I chose one. It was kind of arbitrary. Um, if you want to use another one, how about x equals to 5, right? There was nothing special about 1. It was just an easy one to use. So if I used 5 arbitrarily, just randomly picking a number, we get this, which means y equals to 10 over 3 plus 1 over 3 or 11 over 3. So we get to another uh, ordered pair of 5 comma 11 thirds. So now if I wanted to use this pair and the slope equal to, what was it, two-thirds? Slope equal to two-thirds. We can arrive at yet another version of our equation. Y minus 11 thirds equals to two-thirds X minus five. X minus five. So if I went over to Desmos and typed in this exact same thing and said, give me the equation, here's the equation, graph the line, this one, or this one, or this one, or this one, they all describe the exact same line. And that was the point I was driving at. Okay. Good. Any, okay. Other, any other questions? Okay, so here's the author's uh, way of solving it. They just solve for y, and then from there you can just read the information. Okay, vertical and horizontal lines. So uh, an equation of the vertical line through the point a comma b 
is the, the equation x equals to a, and the equation of the horizontal line a equals to b is the equation y equals to b. So, you know, one of the big obstacles, hurdles in math is to get used to the notation, the notational style. Uh, sometimes that could be a real issue. So if I just wrote down, you know, x equals to 3, that can get confusing because it, it looks like, you know, there's some equation like, uh, you know, 2x plus 5, and you're saying let x equal to 3. That's, that's one interpretation of what this means. It's a solution to this statement or, or an evaluation. You're asked to evaluate x when x equals to 3. But however, that's not what we mean in this context. In this context, letting x equal to 3 does not represent a unique answer. It represents an infinite number of ordered pairs such that the only constraint we have is that the x better be a 3. And that's something you just have to know from the context that we know that this is the line x equals to 3. Line x equals to 3. So what this is describing is an infinite set of ordered pairs where the x value is a 3 and the y value is allowed to be anything you want. Right? Anything at all. 3 comma 3. So the y value could be a could be a 1, the y value could be a negative 2. It doesn't have to be a whole number, it could be a decimal, it could be 5.21, it could be a pi squared value, it doesn't matter. Any and all, any slash all values, all values are the y. So if we think about what does that picture look like, the picture of all these ordered pairs, well, if we have the x-axis here and the y-axis there, then 3 comma 1 would be a point that is 3 units this way and 1 unit up. There's 3 comma 1. And then 3 comma negative 2, okay, so that's 3 units this way. Let's put the, neg the 3 there. 3 units this way and then negative 2 units that would be down here. Let's say that that's the point 3 comma negative 2. And then uh, 3 units this way, then up by 5.21. 3 comma 5.21. That would be that, right? Uh, and then pi squared, remember pi is like 3.14 squared. That's going to be a little bit more than 9. So I know that 3 comma pi squared is going to be somewhere up there. Anyway, as you can see, the more points I come up with, they're all going to line up like this because what they all have in common is that the x coordinate is always a 3. So eventually, all these infinite dots, remember the y value is any and all possible real values. So eventually, all these get filled in with little dots, so many, an infinite number of dots that to the naked eye, they begin to look like a solid line, but they're not. There are an infinite number of ordered pairs that are so tightly packed that we perceive it to be a solid line. And so this is the vertical line x equals to 3. Good? Questions, questions, questions? So that's the vertical line. And then something similar happens with horizontal lines where now if we're given that the line, the line, well, let's use a different color here, uh, color wheel, a lot pink, is that enough difference? If they tell you that the line, wait, well, whatever, uh, the line is y equals to uh, negative 2, then uh, same thing happens where this describes a whole family, an infinite number of ordered pairs with, where what they have in common is that the y coordinate of the ordered pair is a negative 2. So blank comma negative 2, blank comma negative 2, blank comma negative 2, where the input, the x coordinate, is any and all possible values of the x coordinate. So maybe it's like 3, or maybe it's uh, negative 5, or maybe it's the number e. Right, so it doesn't matter, the x coordinate is anything at all, but I know that the y value has to be a negative 2, 
So if you think about what that graph would kind of look like, it would look a little like this. Here is the x coordinate, here I'm sorry, the y axis, the x axis. And so uh, 3, comma, negative 2 would be a point. Back to pink here. Uh, 3, comma, negative 2 would be maybe like around here. So 3 units this way, and then negative 2 units this way. So this would be the point 3, comma, negative 2. And then negative 5, negative 2 would be this way, negative 5 down to negative 2. So that would be like a point there. Negative 5, comma, negative 2. Uh, and so on and so forth. So if the x is allowed to be anything at all, but the common characteristic is that the y is always negative 2, eventually all these dots that have a y value of negative 2 would begin to form a value like this. And there's so many of these dots that eventually they would look like a solid line to the naked eye. And so this would be the line y equals negative 2. It's a horizontal line. Okay, so all the equations that have horizontal uh, horizontal lines are going to be of the form y equals to negative and then uh, a negative, sorry, y equals a constant, and in this case it's negative 2. Any questions? No, no, no. So an equation for the vertical line uh, that goes through the point 3 comma 5 would be the line x equals to 3 and it might be useful to actually label it as a line since it looks confusing to just say x equals 3. Um, the graph of the equation the graph of the equation x equals to 3 is the vertical line with x intercept uh, 3. Okay. I'm not really sure why this is written this way. It seems like there's no question. <laughs> this is a statement or a question anyway. Uh, an equation for the horizontal line through the point um, 8 comma negative 2 is y equals to negative 2. Good. Questions, questions, questions. Um, the graph of the equation y equals to negative 2 is a horizontal line with a y-intercept at x equals to negative 2. Okay, I think these are all pretty straightforward. And here's some graphs, the line um, x equals to 3, and as we were pointing out, or the statements before we're pointing out, if we have the vertical line x equals to 3, then this point right there is the point where it crosses the x-axis, and so it's x-intercept point is the point 3 comma 0. And notice that vertical lines do not cross the y-axis, so no uh, y-intercept point, uh, and no y-intercept. And that's true for almost all vertical lines, except the most obvious vertical line, which is this one, the y-axis. So in fact, the y-axis, y-axis, is actually equal to the vertical line x equals 0, right, which looks confusing. Uh, same thing in this direction now. These are horizontal lines, right? So these are the, the horizontal lines. And it goes through this point right there, which is the point 0, comma, negative 2. So that's its y-intercept point, y intercept and again it doesn't have uh, no x intercept point except again the most obvious equation which is the one horizontal line that is the x-axis so the x-axis the x-axis is the vertical uh, horizontal line line y equals to 0. 
Good. Questions, questions, questions. And if you're just given some random points, like up here they gave you the point uh, 8 comma negative 2, 3 comma 5. So 3 comma 5 would be just a point, say, up there. 3 comma 5. And they said it's a vertical line. Well, then all you have to do is focus on the fact that it's a vertical line. It goes through this point. Then that must be the value needed to find the equation of the vertical line. Or negative or 8 comma negative 2. 8 comma negative 2 would be a point, say, out here. And I know the scale's off, but uh, if this is the point 8 comma negative 2, and you know it's a horizontal line, then you know you just have to focus on that value right there to tell you the equation of the horizontal line that goes to the point 8 comma negative 2. Any questions? No, no, no. Okay, one final form of a linear equation which is also pretty popular is the general form, also known as the standard form of a linear equation which is of the form ax, um, AX plus by uh, equal, uh, plus c equals 0, or sometimes uh, the c is on the other side, and so the other popular way to write this is ax plus by equals c, where c is a constant, so it doesn't really matter whether you move it uh, in one direction or the other. And again, there are, uh, there are three popular ways to describe linear equations. But you can always use algebra to mix and match and rewrite them and reshape them so that the, uh, the same uh, line can be expressed in different ways. It's just that sometimes there's advantages to writing in one way versus writing it in another way. And one of the most um, useful advantages to writing it in this form is that it makes it very easy to find the x and y intercepts. To find the x intercept, right, to find the to find the x-intercept of any equation, well, the x-intercept happens when the y is 0. So you let y equal to 0 and solve. To find the y-intercept of any line, the y-intercept happens when the x-coordinate is 0. So you plug in x equals to 0 and solve. Um, so that's what makes it um, one of the nice advantages of this, because it makes it really easy to plug in x equals to 0, solve for y, that's how you can find your intercept, or the other way around, let y equal to 0, solve for x, and then that's how you can find your, your intercept that way. Okay. Um, so you can play around with these equations and manipulate them and rewrite them into the slope-intercept form, or if you want, you can also uh, work with them and write them in the, um, in the, in the other form. Okay. Um, so here's the standard one. Remember, A, B, and C are both, um, well, A and B are non-zero values. All right, so let's work with this guy. How do we come up with a quick little sketch of this thing? Well, let's find the intercepts. Like I was saying, that's the easiest way to work with it. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is add 12 to both sides. Move that guy over there. And I'll end up with 2x minus 3y equals to 12. Okay, so to find the x-intercept, I'm going to, you know, here is the, uh, to find any place where the graph is going to cross the x-axis to find the x-intercept point, it means that the y equals to 0. So I'm going to replace the y with a 0, and I'll solve for x. So we end up with 2x equals 12. So x equals 12 divided by 2, or x equals to 6. So I end up with 6, 0 as my, um, my x-intercept point. Any questions? Set y equal to zero. So here's my x-intercept point. And then um, to find my y-intercept point, and this thing is failing. 
find the y-intercept point, we're going to set x equal to 0. Because right, uh, if I want to figure out when this line crosses the y-axis, what's common, a common characteristic of any point on the y-axis, is that the x-coordinate equals 0. So plugging it into here, I end up with 2 times 0, that x equal to 0, minus 3y equals 12. So minus 3y equals to 12. So y equals to 12 divided by negative 3, or y equals to negative 4. And so I get the ordered pair uh, 0, comma, negative 4 as my y-intercept points. Once I find those two points, then I can rough, uh, draw a rough sketch of what this graph looks like. 0, comma, negative 4, we'll say is here. And 6, comma, 0, we'll say it's there. As a rough sketch, this is good enough. And you just make sure you label all your points, and then it doesn't matter how ugly it is. If it's all labeled, then that counts as a rough sketch. So, um, let's put a different color. Would you connect them or? Yes, just I'm just trying to get a different color. Okay. But yeah, so that way and that way. And this is this equation. So this is the equation 2x minus 3y minus 12 equals 0. All right, so whenever you're asked to sketch a graph um, of a line, all you have to do is identify two points, the most convenient points that work for you, identify them, label them, draw the line that connects them, and you're, you're good to go. It, now, this didn't say anything about finding the x or y intercepts, but it just it's just the easiest way to, to find it here. If you want to do it in a different way, that's fine too. All right, so just to clarify it, so this is the x-intercept point. Uh, and this is the y-intercept point. So I was just pointing out sort of the advantage of, of dealing with something in this form. It makes it really easy to find these two points. Um, however, like I said, you can always play around with these equations. So the other way to solve this, the other popular way to solve this question, would be to solve for y, use your algebra skills to solve for y, put it into the slope-intercept form, and then from there we can find the y-intercept as well as the slope, and we can use those two values to also sketch this graph. Right, so we would start the same way of moving a 12 to the other side, also subtracting a 2x from the other side, minus 2x plus 12. So we have minus 3y remaining. Come on. Minus 3y remaining on the left-hand side equals to negative 2x plus 12. And then we would divide everything by negative 3. And so we would end up with the equation y equals to positive 2 thirds x um, minus 4. OK, so then here is the same equation. This equation is equal to this equation. So this is same as same as y equals to 2 thirds x minus 4. And from here, we can easily tell that this is the slope and this is the y, this is the b. So 0 comma negative 4 is the y-intercept, which matches with what we had before. Man, my computer is not happy matches that same and now if we wanted to use the slope we can do the little thing where we can create a little triangle and figure out the rise over run as related to the the slope to be able to get to another point um, so we can I think this will end up giving us a value here so we can do this so rise of 2, run of 3 would get us to the point uh, 3, comma, negative 2. 
And then if we do it again, uh, we can come up with another triangle here where this is 3 and this is a 2. And that gets us to 6, 0. Or we can think about this giant triangle, and this will be a 6 in this direction uh, and a 4 in this direction. And that's how we arrive at the same thing. So either way, all three of these points are consistent with the slope of 2 thirds. Any questions? No? No? We're good? We're good? Okay, so let's see how they quit. the author did this. So, solution one. Okay. Um, yeah, they, they uh, found the x-intercept by substituting y equals to zero. You can find the, uh, sorry, you can find the, the y-intercept by substituting x equals to zero and solving. Okay, so then they got the exact same thing. Solution two, to rewrite it in the slope-intercept form. Yep, they did exactly what I did. And solve for it. Okay, cool. And then you can use the triangle, little triangles to come up with other ordered pairs. So this is where that um, 3 comma negative 2 would come in. 3 comma negative 2. Right? Because we go out 3 units this way. We started out at 0, so we go out to 3 units and we end up with a 3. And we start at a depth of negative 4, and we go up by 2, so we end up at depth of negative 2. And then if we wanted to, they didn't ask us to, but if we wanted to, we can do it again. And then that's how we arrive at this point there. We go another 3 units this way, another 2 units that way, and that's how we arrive at 6, 0. Questions, questions, questions? Okay, perpendicular and parallel lines, we're almost done. Uh, so parallel lines are two lines that are non-vertical lines, um, and they have the same slope. Now, if they are vertical lines, then by default they are parallel, right? They both have the same undefined slope. Uh, so all vertical lines are automatically parallel. Uh, you just have to be, make sure that you are given two separate actual equations. Sometimes they trick you where you think that you have two separate lines, but really they're the same line. But as long as you have two unique vertical lines, they're always uh, uh, parallel to each other. Um, so if we're talking about anything other than vertical, uh, vertical lines, two non-vertical lines are parallel if and only if they have the same slope. So find the equation of the line through this point that is parallel to this line. So very classic question. So we have this equation here, and we want to find a separate equation that is parallel to this one, but also goes through that point. So the first thing we have to do is find the equation of this, I'm sorry, find the slope of this equation, because we know that's the slope that we want to use for our equation. Okay, so solving for y, minus 5, for example, there, we end up with 4x plus 6y equals to negative 5, and then uh, minus 4, minus 4 minus 4x, so we end up with 6y equals to minus 4x minus 5, and now we divide everything by 6, So we end up with y equals to negative 4 over 6x minus 5 over 6, which means y equals to negative 2 thirds x minus 5 over 6. So here is the slope. That's the slope we want to use then. I want my equation to be uh, parallel to this one. So therefore, I want y equals to negative 2 thirds x plus b. So now, the only thing that's missing is this b. I need to figure out what that value is. Now, I didn't, they didn't give it to us because they didn't give me the y-intercept point. They just gave me some other random point. So now I can use this point to find the b. I'm going to let in my point, the point that's given, I'm going to let this one be my x and this one be my y. Whatever the value of b is, it has to be something that satisfies this condition. It must be true that this is an ordered pair solution. 
So it must be true that y, uh, which is equal to 2, 2 equals to 2 thirds times 5 plus b. So now we can find that value of b. 2 equals to negative 10 over 3 plus b. So therefore, 2 plus 10 over 3 equals b. We need a common denominator, which is going to be a 3. So 3 over 3 is going to give me a 6 over 3. 6 over 3 plus 10 over 3 equals to b. Or b equals to 16 thirds. So now I have everything I need for my equation. My equation is going to be y equals to negative 2 thirds x plus 16 over 3. So here is the equation of the line that is parallel. Any questions about that? Yes. Uh, yes. For the negative 5, 6 in the first equation, does that have any relevancy or is it kind of just like a, we kind of figured it out? And just use the M. Well, it has relevancy to this line, which is the line that was given. So this is the y-intercept for the line that was given. Oh, yeah. So, But okay. we aren't interested in that line. We're interested in a brand new line that's parallel. Yeah. And so as long as we use this slope, we will come up with parallel equations. There's an infinite number of them, uh, yeah. but we want specifically the one that goes through that point. Desmos does a fantastic job of doing these kinds of things. Let's, let's give them a chance again. Uh, let's get rid of this thing. Oops, no, I don't want to stop it. Um, so, for example, what was the equation? Uh, 4x, 4x plus 6y plus 5 equals to 0. So we can just type it in directly like that. So there's the equation. Go away. So here's the equation of the line, um, written exactly the way it was presented to us. But then, okay, well, we solved it in a different way. We said this is equal to uh, 2 thirds and 5 sixths. y equals to 2 3 x and negative 5 divided by 6. There we go. Okay, so once I solve for y, see here is the original one in blue. Here's the line. Maybe I can zoom out a little more. Here's the line in blue, the way it was originally given. And then here's the line when I solve for y. See, they're the exact same line. Okay, so here it is. And where is our uh, slope? Here is our slope right there. And our y-intercept is this point right here. So here's our y-intercept. When we divide... Um, um, 5 divided by 6, we're going to get 0.833. That's where that is right there. Okay, but then we are also interested in a parallel line. Well, any other equation that has the same slope of 2 divided by 3 is going to give us um, a parallel line, like that purple one is parallel. Or I can make it plus 3, and that one is uh, parallel. Or I can make it plus 5, or I can make it minus 5. 5, right? So I can turn it into a slider here, plus b. And now if I move this around, you see that the purple one moves everywhere, right? It just depends on where that y-intercept is. Um, and we can graph that y-intercept as uh, 0, comma b and label it. Uh, so you can see that as I move this, as I change the b value, I create an infinite number of possible uh, uh, parallel lines to the given one, right? The green one was the given one. But in particular, they wanted me to find the equation of the line that also goes to the point 5, comma 2. So let's label that guy on here. Uh, the point 5, comma 2. So there it is. That little dot right there is 5, comma 2. So you can see, even though there's an infinite number of lines that are parallel to the green one, there's only going to be one parallel one that also goes to the point uh, 5, comma 2. Good. So Desmos automatically looks like it kind of locked into it. I'm not sure if that's the equation of it or not, if it's just moving it around. But at any rate, uh, so that's what we're after.
Good, so hopefully, if we got the right answer, we can check it here. It is, what, two thirds, and then 16 over three was the correct answer. So let's put it in here, to get the B. Oh, let's have a 16 over three, 16 divided by three. There we go. So 16 divided by three is uh, 5.4, and that's the equation of the line that goes through this point, but is per uh, parallel to this green one. Any questions? Okay, now let's look at the other one. The other case would be to look at um, perpendicular lines. So two lines uh, with slopes m sub 1 and m sub 2 are perpendicular if and only if it's true that when you multiply them together, they equal negative 1. Another way of saying that is that if you solve for m sub 2, we divide both sides of this equal sign by m sub 1, then we end up with this equation m sub 2 equals to negative uh, over uh, negative 1 over m sub 1, or we, we refer to this as negative reciprocals. Negative reciprocals. Either way, I think this is probably the easiest way to memorize it. The multiplication of both slopes equals negative 1. But any way you want to, you know, whatever way makes sense to you is fine. Uh, but this is saying that this is just the way it works. Two lines are perpendicular to each other if their slopes have this relationship. When you multiply their slopes, they equal negative 1. Um, or they are negative reciprocals of each other. This is, um, um, this is useful in, say, this example. Show that this point, these three points are vertices of a right triangle. Okay, so we should first of all get a general sense of where these points are. Uh, 3, 3, 8, 17, and, um, okay, so in a grid system, roughly speaking here, we have points, let's say this is 3 and 3. So here's that first point. And then 8, 17, that's going to be way over here. So that's one... Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, and then three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, and then way up here. So like way up there. And then um, eleven and five. So this one was like eight, so a little bit higher and like over here, and then something like that. So is this a right triangle? is what we want to find out. So maybe there, that's what we want to find out, right? Question mark, is that a right triangle? Um, okay, so we need to find the slope of this line, the slope of that line, and if it's true that they are, um, are negative reciprocals of each other, then we can conclude that they are, right? So this is point uh, point P here, point Q up there, and point R over here. Um, so looking at uh, P and R, let's look at P and R. This one, the slope. What do I want to do? Say M sub P R. The slope of these two. Okay, so P and R. So I'm going to do. Uh, 3 minus 5 over 3 minus 11. That gets me negative 2 over negative 8. Which gets me to positive 1 fourth. And then the slope of Q and R. Uh, Q and R. So that's going to be 17 minus 5 over 8 minus 11, so that gets me to 12 over negative 3, which equals to positive 4, oops, sorry, negative 4, and so note that the slope of the PR1 times the slope of the QR1 
uh, is equal to uh, multiply these uh, is equal to one fourth times negative four, which equals to negative one. So that shows that proves that this is ninety degrees. The line line PR and line QR are perpendicular. Good. Questions, questions, questions? At any rate, all right, let's get back to it. Uh, the last and final section in section uh, chapter, uh, chapter one, section 11, solving equations and inequalities graphically. It should go quickly, hopefully, since this is where you use technology to solve these equations. So we're gonna solve equations graphically and then solve inequalities graphically. Uh, so sometimes an equation or inequality may be difficult or impossible to solve algebraically. Um, in this case, we use, uh, we use the method of graph graphical method. So we can graph the equations or the inequalities and then use our graphs to either sometimes get an exact answer, but most often when we use this approach, we're not going to get an exact answer. Most often we're going to get an approximation. And often a good approximation is good enough. Okay, so... To solve a one variable equation of the form uh, 3x minus 5 equals to 0, <clears throat> that's a very easy algebraic thing to solve, right? All you have to do is move the 5 over, divide everything by 3. We can easily look at this and just solve it in our heads and say that the answer is x equals to 5 over 3, right? Move the 5 over, divide by 3, 5 over 3. Okay, um, but let's explore it in a, um, you know, if we explore this in a graphical way, uh, what we want to do is set the y equal to this side of our equation. And then here we have a, uh, a two variable equation that we can graph into our rectangular coordinate system, right? So this is the equation of a line where the slope is three and the y intercept, y -intercept is zero comma negative five. So when we graph this, what we want to do is look for the point that has a y equal to zero. The y equals to zero means that it's the place where this line is going to cross the x-axis. Good. So the solution is going to be the x, uh, x-intercept point. Does that make sense? Kind of, maybe, kind of, maybe. Okay, so... Yeah more specifically okay here it is so sometimes it's given to you like this already but it might not be so just expanding on that same exact same um question it could be given like this solve for x and then of course algebraically we could solve for it um and algebraically we'd say okay let's move this over here plus four plus four so we end up with three x equals to five and so x equals to 5 over 3. So x equals to 1 and 2 thirds, so 1.67 approximately. Uh, um, it's approximately the answer to this guy over here. Okay, uh, or graphically, this is 3x minus 4 equals to 1. Okay, so we want to set it equal to 0, even if it's not given as zero to begin with. Uh, so we end up with three X minus five equals zero. And now what we want to do is consider this part, oops, consider this part over here, right? After we've set it equal to zero, and we're going to consider this equation, Y equals to three X minus five. Right. This has a slope of 3, and from here we get that the y-intercept is going to be 0, comma, negative 5. Okay, so this is the graphing section. We get to use our technology. We can just graph this. So let me, let me use Desmos again to graph this. So we want to graph y equals to 3x minus 5. 
get rid of these guys. Uh, y equals to 3x minus 5. Uh, is it minus 5 or plus 5? Yeah, minus 5. Okay, so here is that equation, 3x minus 5. Here's the y-intercept, 0 comma negative 5. So this is the equation y equals to 3x minus 5. And this is what we're after right there. The place where it crosses the x-axis, the x-intercept point, that's a point where y equals to 0, and so x equals this value right in here. Right, so... Uh, 1.667 comma 0 is a solution to this equation. So if we had sort of the traditional style table where we do this, this where we have ordered pairs, well, we can find different ones. Like, for example, if we let x equal to 1, then y equals to 3 times 1 minus 5 means y equals to negative 2. So here is the ordered pair 1 comma negative 2. Okay, well graphically we found, sort of reverse engineered this, we found that um, 1.667 comma 0 was a point on this line, which means that this was the case where um, the answer was 0 when we inputted 3 times 1.667 minus 5, that this is approximately equal to 0, which means that the x was the 1.667. Okay, um, so that solves this right here. So I said, we're trying to solve this. We said, okay, let's consider this. Well, this is the case. This is equal to this. This is the case when y equals to 0. Right, right there, y equals to zero is the same thing as the case when this equation, and we find when this equals to zero, which means that it's the x-intercept point. Good. Questions, questions, questions? So this is the graphing section, so you're going to graph it, right? If you're wondering, well, how am I supposed to find this answer? How am I supposed to find this 1.667? Uh, when I get it into this form, well, you graph it. That's the whole point. So, uh, like I said, Desmos is a fantastic tool. Uh, you're welcome to use it for anything that's uh, 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 that involves graphing. And then, of course, um, our TI-84 calculators are also a great tool. Um, for me, this semester, of course, you get to use Desmos because you're at home and you have access to it, so why not? It's a fantastic tool. Uh, but moving forward, you know, when we eventually go back to uh, the classroom, uh, most of us will only have access to TI-84s in the uh, in, in the classroom. So we will have um, an app for it so I can demonstrate it. But uh, if you don't know how to graph it on your calculator, we, we will get to that. Good, good. Okay, so... Here's a comparison of the two. We can solve it algebraically, as I did, and we get our answer there. Or we can graph it, sorry, solve for zero, then consider this part, graph y equals to 3x minus 5, and then find where it crosses the x-axis. So the advantage of the algebraic method is that we get an exact answer. Um, on the other hand, um, if it's really difficult, ugly numbers, uh, or maybe even the equation is so complicated it might be hard or impossible to find uh, the algebraic method. And in cases like that, it's really where the, the graphical method shines uh, that we can easily get a pretty good approximation if not, uh, from our graph. Good, so here's some other examples. Here we have three different equations. Uh, they're all quadratic equations. x squared minus 4x plus 2 x squared minus 4x plus 4, x squared minus 4x plus 6, right, all equal to 0. And we want to find out the value of x that makes these true, right? When, what value of x would make these true? And so this is a perfect application of our quadratic formula. 
right? Each one of these are quadratics that fit the standard form of a quadratic equation. Remember the standard form is ax plus by, oops, uh, a, wrong one, sorry, I was thinking linear equations, ax squared plus um, bx plus c equals zero. Uh, so for all of these, the role of a is being played by a one, and the role of b is being played by a negative four. The only thing that really changes is the role of c. Here, c equals to two, here, c equals to four, and here, c equals to six. Uh, so all we have to do is plug them into our quadratic formula, which is going to be um, x equals to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And we plug them into here, and these are the values we're going to get. So for, for part a, x is going to be equal to negative b, so that's going to be positive 4 negative negative 4 plus or minus the square root of negative 4 squared minus 4 times a which was a 1 times c which is a 2 for, for part a for the first part of the question all over 2 times a which is a 1 divided by 2. So this will give me 16 minus 8, or the square root of 8. So this would be 4 plus or minus root 8 over 2. And then this will be 4 times 2. The 4 comes out to give me a 2. So this will give me the 4 plus or minus 2, root 2, all over 2. And then that reduces to this. Good. Questions, questions, questions? For case B, uh, same application. All we have to do is change the value of C to be a 4 instead of a 2. So we just change this to a 4. If we change that to a 4, we get that x equals to negative, negative 4 plus or minus the square root of negative 4 squared minus 4 times 1 times 4 all over 2 times 1 and then we end up with 16 minus 16 so everything inside this radical becomes 0 this whole thing just becomes the square root of 0 which is 0 so we really just end up with 4 divided by 2 So this whole thing reduces to positive 4 over 2, which equals to 2. Good. And then in the last case, that last value becomes a 6. So we end up with um, negative 4 squared minus 4 times 1 times 6, which is going to be 16 minus 24. We're going to end up with a negative inside the radical which means that it turns into imaginaries, so therefore we end up with these two solutions. Let's plug those in. So we end up with x equals to negative, negative 4 plus or minus the square root of negative 4 squared minus 4 times 1 times 6 all over 2 times 1 which means x equals to positive 4 plus or minus square root of 16 minus 24 is going to be negative 8 all over 2. So then we know we pull out that negative 1 becomes 4 plus or minus uh, 2i root 2 all over 2 and that's how we get these two results. x equals to 2 plus or minus i root 2. <sighs> Any questions? So this last case, there are two imaginary solutions. Um, and you know, this is why we like to, this is a good point, we like to put the i in front 
because this looks confusing. This almost looks like the eye is inside the root, but it's not, just to make sure it's clear. This eye, I would write it in front, because otherwise it looks like the eye is inside there, so it's not in there. Okay, anyway, so two imaginary solutions, which means that there are no real solutions. Okay, so this is the algebraic method of solving all of these. And then, of course, the, the graphical method would be to graph them and figure out when y equals to 0. y equals to 0 means that it's where it crosses the x-axis. So we can just graph these and determine the points from there. So if we graph them, they would look like this. This parabola here, this is the first one, graphs this way. So we have this point and this point. The uh, y-coordinate of these two points is going to be 0. So all we have to do is figure out what the x-coordinate is of those. Okay, so this is going to be something comma zero is what goes right in there. And then this is going to be something comma zero. That's the one that goes right in there. And these two somethings are the ones we need to figure out. And again, we can approximate them by using, a calcula uh, using our calculator or some other graphical device that will help us figure out where that is. Good. Questions, questions? And same thing for this one. This is the second equation. And remember, we only got one answer, which was a 2. So that's how we know that this one right here is going to be 2 comma 0. And I can tell that my solution is y equals to, y equals to uh, sorry, x equals to 2. And that's for this one. Good. And then the last one, if we graph it, we get this which means it never crosses the x-axis. So this is what it looks like when we have imaginary solutions. So no real solutions. No real solutions. The graphical method is not going to be able to identify for you the, uh, the imaginary solutions unless you graph in including the imaginary axes. Uh, so for that reason, um, we, we wouldn't get it, right? We're always graphing in the real number, uh, the real number values in the coordinate, Cartesian coordinate system, X and Y. Um, so we'd have to introduce a new axis and make it like a three-dimensional picture to identify where, what the I is, and we're not dealing with that right now. So when we graph these and it never crosses the X axis, it means that it does not have uh, a real number solution. Good. Questions, questions, questions? No, no, you did? Okay. Um, so, okay, that's the same thing. Inequalities. Same thing with inequalities. All we have to do is set one side equal to zero. So if you have to do a little bit of algebra, uh, to move around so that, so that we have uh, a linear equation is greater than or equal to zero or less than or equal to zero, right? So we move it around to set it equal to zero. And then we consider the equation y equals to uh, the left-hand side. And then we can use our line, our graph, to be able to, um, to, to approximate our solution. So in this case, we're working with 3x minus 5 is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, we're going to work with the left-hand side, so we're going to let y equal this left-hand side, right? So that's where we come up with this equation. When we graph it, we'll come up with a linear equation that has a slope of 3, a y-intercept of 0, comma, negative 5. And what we want to do is figure out the input values of x such that the output value is greater than or equal to 0, meaning that it's above the x-axis. All the positive outputs is what we're looking for. Uh, so we can easily see that when we graph it. So here is the, the equation of the line when we graph it. It's going to have a, a slope of 3 and a y-intercept of, of negative 5. Right? So this point over here is 0, comma, negative 5. And we can see that that point right there, the x-intercept point, is the place where, where, that we're after. Because from x inputs of this value to the right, all of these values here are values such that when you input them into this equation, the output is going to be greater than or equal to zero. Does that make sense? Yep. 
We're good, 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 good. Okay, so the solution is gonna be this entire set of values here because anytime you pick any value here, let a x equal to a, this is a place where you plug it in and the output is going to be positive, right? Positive outputs. Positive y outputs. Um, right, where this is the equation y equals to 3x minus 5. Good. Questions, questions, questions? Pretty easy, right? So again, the only tricky part is, well, how do you find this particular point right there? Well, this is the graphing section, so graph it into uh, uh, some sort of technology and figure out where where, where that answer is. Desmos does a fantastic job with these, like I said. And so here's where uh, the real beauty of these things comes in. Ugly, ugly numbers, ugly equations. Uh, and this becomes a really useful trick in a lot of questions in this class as well as calculus. There's lots of places where the following trick is very, very nice. To ver figure out this really nasty inequality, what values of x make this true? That's what we're after. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to consider this equation over here, y equals to 3.7x squared plus 1.3x minus 1.9, okay? And then we're going to consider this equation over here, sort of a separate one, equation y equals to 2.0 minus 1.3 for x, graph this one, graph that one, and I want to figure out what input values of x result in the red one being smaller, the red output being smaller than the blue output. Okay, so let's just use Desmos to solve for this one. Let's go over here. Okay, so the first one was... Okay, so y equals to 3.7x to the second power uh, plus 1.3x minus 1.9. Okay, so there's the first one. It's a parabola. That makes sense. This is a quadratic equation. The second one, let's get it. Second equation is 2.0 minus 1.4x. And how come we did not? Oh, there it is. Uh, do we have a blue? Blue. Let's see what they match. There. Okay, so the red one is the parabola, the blue one is the line, is a linear equation. And what I want to know is what values of x result in the red one, the output red, being smaller than the blue. Right, that's what we're after. So we can just check it out in here. Zoom in here. When is the blue smaller? Come on. From this point there to this point there, right? I can tell that from this x-coordinate value of negative 1.454 over to this x-coordinate value of um, 0 0.725, uh, between those two points are the x-coordinate values such that the result of the parabola will be smaller than the output of the line making that inequality true. Does that make sense? I think there's a nice little thing here anyway. So this is the a similar kind of situation here. So we graph the parabola, we graph the line, the parabola and the line, 
And so I found this point and I found this point and it's just the X coordinate values that I'm interested. The X coordinate values that trap this little region in here, you know, let's make it in green. Uh, as I bring this guy down here and then bring this guy down here, this region in green will define the X coordinates, the, the region of X coordinates, such that if I evaluate both this left side, this is the parabola, and then this is the line, uh, any X coordinate value in this green zone will result in the parabola output being smaller, less than or equal to the result of the line. Good. Questions, 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 questions. And so here, negative 1.45 and 0 0.2, same thing I got over here, right? Yeah. So it's just a matter of how close do you want to get. As we said, the drawback of this method is that you're not going to get a lot of precision. But depending on your tools, you can get pretty precise. So you can get, we can get even more precise than this if we wanted to, if we used different technologies that allow us to get as close as we need to get. Um, so in, in real world situations, um, you know, this is, this is good enough in many cases. And in some cases you do need an exact answer. Any questions? No, no, this should be the easiest section. You just have to, uh, come up with the appropriate graph and the appropriate equations to graph, find the, the solutions through the graph and then interpret them back into the, the problems that you're assigned. Good questions, questions, questions. All right, so we're done with chapter uh, chapter one, finally. Uh, and we only have about 20 minutes left, so I'll just get started on uh, chapter two since we're running a little behind. So we've got to take advantage of these little minutes here. Uh, 2.1, okay. So easy introduction to chapter two. It'll be a breeze. Chapter two is all about functions, introduction to function notation. Um, and that should, I think, for the most part, feel pretty easy. Whoa. Okay, good enough. All right, functions. Um, functions, function notation, right? So functions are all in a, around us. We're gonna define what a function is. We're gonna uh, ex, um, evaluate functions. Uh, we're gonna find the domains of functions and then think about how to represent functions in different ways. Um, so functions are all around us. So for example, um, we could be thinking about um, heights and the age of people, right? So the height of a person uh, can be a function of their age. Right? So here we have a, a graph where we have uh, their ages along the horizontal axes and their heights in the vertical direction. Um, we could have temperature as a function of dates. Um, could also be times. So like throughout the day, various times or days of the year, um, something like this. So we can of course have temperature as a function of the, of the date. Um, and here we have postage prices as of 2014. Uh, so the, 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 the price of mailing something, an object, is dependent on the, the weight of the object to a certain extent, right? So uh, something weighs between zero to one ounce. This is what they charge, 98 cents. Something weighs between five to six ounces. I'm sorry, between four to five ounces, inclusive of five. Um, they charge $1.82. So postage is a function of weight. Temperature is a function of the date. Height is a function of age. Right, so just different examples of where functions can be used. Um, okay, so that's just what we just said. Uh, some other examples. The area of a circle is a function of its radius. The number of bacteria in a culture is a function of time. The weight of an astronaut is a function of her elevation. 
The price of a commodity is a function of the demand for the commodity. Uh, the rule that describes how the area of a circle depends on the radius r is given by the formula uh, area equals to pi r squared. Okay, so definition of a function. Uh, a function is a rule. Um, to talk about a function, we need to give it a name. So we, we usually use the letters f, g, h. It's just sort of common, customary uh, results. So for example, we can use the letter f to represent the rule that follows. So f is the rule square the number or square the input. Um, and we, we can uh, define that set of instructions of squaring the input or squaring a number uh, by the letter f. We can define it that way so we can reference it. So a function is a rule that assigns to each element x in a set a exactly one element called, a, uh, called f of x in a set b. So this, let's, let's explore this for a little bit. Um, so we are used to working with something like this, right, where, where we consider this as the input and y is the output. So all we're doing is we're going to rewrite this to follow this notation, f of x equals to x squared, where the f of x together is the y f of x is the y. Okay, so the only thing that uh, I think people have a real difficult time with is distinguishing that the letter f here is not a variable, right? So a very common mistake is people do this, they take the f of x equals x squared, and then they divide both sides by, I don't know, divide this side by x, divide this side by x, so they get that f equals x. And you know they simplified it this way, and this is nonsense, right? This doesn't make this doesn't make any sense. You have to really understand the the um, what the f represents here to recognize that you can't do this. Good. Okay. So f um, is not a variable to be solved. You cannot add it, subtract it, divide it. Um, f f of x together, this little unit thing right here is the output, is the y. Good. It's just, um, there's some value, there's a lot of value to writing it this way, as I'm sure, this is review, so I'm sure many of you guys are already aware of this. But at any rate, okay, so the little unit, f of x, is the output, it's the y, um, and it's going to be a rule where the input value x is um, assigned to one output value f of x, uh, the set from the input values is called the domain, which is typically um, typically we use capital letters to represent sets. So often we use set A um, uh, for, to be the, the the domain, and set B to be the range. Okay, uh, so the symbol f f of x, right? As I've been saying, so this notation reads as f of x, f of x. Uh, and it's called the value of f at x or the image of x under f. Um, these next, these last two are not as popular as just saying f of x. Um, the set uh, a is the domain of the function, and the range of f is the set of all possible values of f of x uh, as x varies throughout the domain. So it's all the possible outputs. The domain is all the possible inputs. The f of x is all the possible outputs. Um, <clears throat> the, the symbol that represents an arbitrary number for the domain of x is called the independent variable. Usually we like to use the letter x as the independent variable, but it doesn't have to be. The symbol that represents uh, a number in the range of f is called the dependent variable. Usually we like to use the letter y, but not always. And in this case, we're saying that the y is also known as, also written as f of x. Remember, a little unit thing. You can't separate the f from the x. Good. Then x is the independent variable and y is the uh, dependent variable in, in the traditional way of writing um, a function equation.
equation and function notation. Many of you guys might have used the machine diagram uh, to describe a, a function, right? A, a function is like a machine, the machine f, where we input values of x and the output is um, f of x as the output. And inside the machine, there might be some set of instructions. You know, whatever the input is, double it, add four, divide by seven, take the square root of the whole thing, right? There's operational instructions that are provided for every qualifying input value. And then it qualifying, and then after we apply those instructions, we get an output value. Good. And remember, for a function, to be valid, there's only one important rule we must remember. A function must be a situation that every time we input a valid qualifying number, every time we input a value, there is a unique output. Right Now, uh, we are not allowed to have a case where we input one number and out comes different answers. We have to have one unique answer every time we input something. Questions, questions? What we are allowed to do is we are allowed to have different numbers give you the same output. Right, so that, that little confusion happens. So there could be a case where we input a three and then the machine says double it, triple it, multiply by something, divide. There's a set of instructions and maybe the output after all that work is the number one. Well, it's also possible that maybe if we input the number seven, for whatever reason, square it, subtract 2, divide, take whatever the instructions are for f. After all that work, maybe it still gives you a 1. And that's okay. That's a function. We're okay with that. What we are not allowed to do is have a case where we input a 3 and we square it, divide it, do whatever we're going to do in here, and the output is a 2, but also the output is a 9. We can't have that for a function. Each input must have a unique output, not two different outputs. But we are allowed to have different inputs give you the same output. Any questions about that? Here is a graphical representation of that same thing. We use these little jelly bean style things to describe um, 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 inputs and outputs and domains. So this would be the domain of the function. And this blue one would be the range, right? And so here we are describing a mapping. If the input is a one, if the traditionally x, right? If we have f of x style notation, um, then we're inputting an x value. So here we're saying x equals to one. Now we didn't describe the actual operations that are happening. Am I going to add something, divide something, multiply by something? The actual set of instructions was not provided. All we know is that when you input a 1 into your function, the output is a 20. And when you input a 2 into your equation, the output is also 20. That's okay. We're allowed to have that under functions. Different inputs are allowed to have the same output. And here the 3 maps to 30, and then the 4 maps to 40. Good. So if this was, uh, you know, the way it's described, this right here, these numbers are exactly the only values in my domain. My domain is made up of 1, 2, 3, and 4. And my range is made up of exactly 20, 30, and 40. Any questions? No, no, no. Okay, here's a couple, uh, here's another example. So this is the one we just covered, but here's another example. Uh, one is being mapped to 10, and then two is being mapped to 20, but also two is being mapped to 30. That's a problem, right? In a function, you are not allowed to have this case right here. The case where one input leads to two different outputs, right, fail. Right, not a function. Uh, uh. 
Anyway, questions? Oh, it says right there. I don't bother writing it. So there's no function. Okay, a function f is um, defined by this formula. Okay, so we have this formula f of x equals to x squared plus 4. Express in words how f acts on the input x to produce the output f of x. Okay, so uh, we can use the language of input. Okay, so here is our input value. And we can verbally describe this as saying when you get an input you want to square the input and add 4 square the input add 4 and then you know English allows you to have some versatility here you can say add 4 you can flip these around and say add 4 to the input squared, uh, or you can also say something like four more, four more than uh, the input squared. The input squared. Okay, so you get the point. There are different ways to verbally express this, this uh, set of rules, that when an input is given, you're going to square it and then add 4 to it. And then this is the output, so you can also throw that into your language. The output equals 4 more than the square of the input, for example, is another way of expressing it. Okay, so we can express it in words. Uh, part B here says to evaluate these. So find f of 3, f of negative 2, f of negative 5. So we have f of x equals to x squared plus 4. And then it says find f of negative 3. So 3, negative 2. Um, okay, so this is saying that I have this like this, and if I want to evaluate this when x is equal to 3, this notation like this means that x equals to 3, um, and so I replace the 3 over there. Now remember, this is the y, it's the output, so there's nothing to solve here, you don't have to divide by 3 or anything. Um, so from this point forward, we just say that f of 3 equals to 9 plus 4 or f of 3 equals to 13 and and this style of notation tells me that the output is 13 when the input is 3 x equals to 3 y equals to 13 All right so that's the nice thing about uh, this style of notation that it allows me to preserve what the input was and what the output is because they're related to each other. Right? The answer is 13 when the input is 3. Good. Okay, well, same thing for the other ones. I'm sure you're fairly very good at evaluating things, so I'm not going to spend more time on that. Um, <clears throat> so evaluating a 3 means we replace the 3 Evaluating a negative 2 means we replace the x with a negative 2. We're evaluating at x equals to root 5, we replace it with a root 5. And so we end up with these corresponding output values. The domain of the function. So the domain consists of all possible input values for f. So when we're considering the domain of the function, we really have to think about where possible problems can arise, right? And there's only a couple of problems we have to think about. Are we accidentally dividing by zero, right? That's something uh, to consider. And the other thing is, are we accidentally taking the even root of a negative number? Um, and in uh, this case, we have a very simple quadratic equation. That's never going to happen. There's, there's no possible input value of x that would result in me dividing by zero. And there is no input value of x that would result in me taking the even root of a negative number. 
So there is no problems. There are no input values that would result in an undefined. So the domain is all real numbers. The range, on the other hand, can be a little trickier. You have to think about all possible output values, um, and that can get a little tricky. Uh, all possible output values, well, considering all the possible input values for x, this part by itself is going to definitely be a positive number, right? Anytime you square any value, you're going to get 0 or more. So the smallest this could possibly be is 0 up to infinity. It can get infinitely large, but the smallest it could ever be is 0. And so if the smallest this could ever be is 0 and you add 4, then combine this side over here, the smallest it could ever be is 4 going up to infinity. And so that turns out to be the range. Good. So the range for this one is from 4 to positive infinity. Another way of getting that is to graph it. If we graph this quadratic, uh, we know that it's going to be a quadratic shifted up by 4. four. So let's see. It looks like this. And it's going to look like that. And this thing is going to be like that x, y, and then that point right there will be the point 0, 4. Good. So the, the input values are all possible x values. And as you can see, we can always input a value of x going out from negative infinity to positive infinity. So this is the domain. From negative infinity to positive infinity. On the other hand, the output values, I don't know what would be, how about blue? The output values start here and they go this way. There's no output value that would ever be a positive 2, or there's no output value that would ever go into the negatives, right? The output of this could never be negative 5, for instance. And so these values here are the range. Range and they start at 4, and they go up to positive infinity. Any questions? No? No, 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 no. No? OK. So machine, OK, that's fine. Evaluating a function, as we just did. Um, if we're given an equation in function notation, for example, f of x equals to 3x squared plus x minus 5, uh, we can think of the x as the blank. The input value goes there. So we can let x equal to 0, we can let x equal to negative 5, whatever value we want. We just have to be careful to apply it. It's very easy when we have a, a number. Like if I said let x equal to 4, okay, so we replace all those blanks there with a 4. But keep in mind that I could also replace it with another letter. I could say find f of find f of w. All right, well, that seems silly. All I have to do is let x equal to w, so replace all the x's with a w. Or I could say let x equal to um, w plus 3. Okay, that means I'd have to replace here this with a w plus 3, replace this with a w plus 3, replace that with a w plus 3, and then simplify it from there. I might have to square this, combine like terms, and all that stuff. We, we, we simplify, combine like terms, reduce everything on the right-hand side, but remember that this doesn't get distributed, uh, simplified, or canceled, or anything at all. We'll review some rules later about what you're allowed to do here, uh, but uh, in general, you don't want to treat this like a variable, so you don't distribute the f and cancel and all that. Right? We leave it alone, because this is saying it's the function evaluated at w plus 3. Good. Questions, questions, questions? So here's an example. We have the same equation, f of x equals to 3x squared plus x minus 5. So if you want to find f of negative 2, uh, we just have to replace all those input values with a negative 2. Or if you want to find f of 0, all we have to do is replace those input values with a 0, and so on and so forth. So these are pretty easy. So here's, let's jump to the thing, to the answer. So uh, this one was f of uh, negative 2, so replace all those x values with a negative 2. 
And then f of 0, well, that one's really easy. 0, 0, it's just going to give me a negative 5. 0, 0, it's just going to give me a negative 5. And f of 4, replace the x value with a 4. Or f of 1 half, again, replace x with the negative, uh, with a 1 half. So those are really easy, I think, I hope. Notice that the net change in the value of function f um, is the value of function f as the input changes from a to b, where a is less than b. So the net change is described by f of b minus f of a. So it's kind of like the change in the y. We have an x-axis here. We have some value b there, and we have some value a there. So the net change in the value of the function as the f, uh, in the value of function f as the input changes from a to b is going to be equal to the net change that happens here. So it started off as an f of a here, whatever that answer is there, and it goes up through some value f of b. This is the y-axis. So the net change is going to be this difference here. Good. Questions, questions, questions. Nope. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, almost done here. So the domain of a function, when you're asked to find the domain of a function, you're looking for all the set of input values that make the function uh, valid. Uh, and so what you really want to do is ask yourself what are the uh, values that make it invalid. Uh, and again, like we covered a, a minute ago, all we have to do is think about um, the possible input values that would cause you to divide by zero or all the values that would cause you to uh, take the even root of a negative number. That's really the only two considerations we have to think about. So if we have a case where neither of those things are possible, such as uh, this, this case here, then the domain would be all real numbers. Good. Um, unless the domain is specifically given to you. Like in this case, they're saying let the domain be uh, the values from 0 to 5. x is any value greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 5. So this, in this particular example, the domain is set. But if this wasn't given to you, you were just given this and you're asked to find the domain, the domain would be all real numbers because there is no value for which you would be um, limited um, by some undefined. Good. Okay, now the range then would then have to be all the possible outputs. So you'd have to consider all the possible outputs that you can get once you restrict um, the values of x to be any value inside your domain. Usually ranges are just a little trickier. Okay, but for now we're just focusing on finding domains. So if we're looking at an equation like this one and you're asked to find the domain, we have to take into consideration that we might accidentally divide by 0 if we let x equals to 4. So the domain is any number except x equals to 4. We can, define, we can write that this way. The domain equals to x such that x doesn't equal to 4. Right? Or a lot of people just write all real numbers except 4. That's fine. Um, and then here, remember, we are not allowed to take the even root of a negative number. So as long as x is greater than or equal to 0, then we're okay. So the domain is uh, all numbers that are greater than or equal to 0 in this case. Any questions? Almost done. Let's look at these cases real quick. Find the domain of each of these. The domain of the first one, well, Clearly, I'm doing some sort of a division, so there might be a value that causes me to divide by zero. So what I have to do is pull that off to the side and figure out what this is. What values of x give me a zero so that I don't divide by zero? Well, this one's easy. We just have to factor out an x. And now we can say by the zero product principle that either that's zero or x minus one is zero over here. So x equals to one there. So there are the two values that would result in a zero in the denominator. The domain is everything else. The domain is all real numbers except 
Um, x cannot be 0, x cannot be 1. Those are the only two things we have to avoid. So you can just write it down like this, or you can use this notation of negative infinity up through 0, don't include 0, union with 0 up through 1, union with 1 up through positive infinity. So that's fine. Um, or the set builder notation, uh, which is squiggly x such that x does not equal 0, x does not equal 1. Right? Any one of those is fine. In here, what we want to do is figure out the values that do not give you a negative inside here. So I want to find x such that 9 minus x squared is greater than or equal to 0. That's what we want to solve. Okay, so add uh, x squared to both sides, and we get x must be this. Or um, flipping it around here, we have um, this plus or minus 3. And you're like, wait a minute, what is that? Looks weird, right? Okay, so um, don't do it this way. We have 9 minus x squared is greater than or equal to 0. We've covered this before. What we want to do is factor this. We have 3 minus x, 3 plus x, greater than or equal to 0. So we have a multiplication of a binomial. Remember, this is a difference of squares. And now we can do the thing where we uh, set up the, uh, the number lines. Here's a number line for 3 minus x. Here is a number line for 3 plus x. And then we can have a number line for the product of the two. 3 minus x times times 3 plus x. OK, so set up where your zeros are on the number line. And then the 0 that happens here, when x equals to 3, we get a 0. So x equals to 3 is the 0. To the right of that number, when I put in numbers that are bigger than 3, like a 4, a 5, or a 6, I'm going to get a bunch of negatives. And when I put numbers that are to the left of that, I'm going to get a bunch of positives, plus, 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 including over here. If I let x equal negative 1, for example, 3 minus negative 1 is positive 4. Good. Okay, looking at this equation, I get a 0 when x equals to negative 3. So let's say that that's right here, negative 3. Negative 3 gives me a 0. And then if I think about values to the right of that, I get positive results. If I put in numbers that are to the right of negative 3, I get positive answers. And if I think of values to the left of that, I'm going to get negative ones, right? Where this is the zero. Yeah. Okay, so now the multiplication of the two, I'm going to get a zero here, and I'm going to get a zero here at three and negative three. And then if I pick values that are to the left of negative 3, I'll end up with a positive times a negative, which means that these will be negatives. If I pick values in between here, I'll get a positive times a positive, which means that these will be positives. And if I pick values over here, I'll get a negative times a positive, which will be equal to a negative. And so going back to answer this question, when is this product positive? When is it bigger than or equal to 0? It's going to be bigger than or equal to 0 here. Okay, so then that gives us my domain. My domain is domain equals all the values that are between negative 3 and positive 3, inclusive of the endpoints. Okay, or you can also just say x less than or equal to 3 greater than or equal to negative 3. Same thing. Good, pretty good. 
finally, last one, um, we have two considerations. We've got to make sure that the denominator is always uh, positive, greater than or equal to zero, but then also we have to make sure we're not accidentally dividing by zero. Uh, so the first consideration means that we have to make sure that t plus 1 is greater than or equal to 0. Which means that if I subtract 1 from both sides, I get that t must be greater than or equal to negative 1. Good. So that's one consideration. Uh, however, the other consideration is that I don't want to divide by 0, so I cannot let t be exactly equal to negative 1. So I eliminate that extra option. And so my domain is just going to be strictly greater than negative 1. So domain is t is strictly greater, strictly greater than negative 1. Right, so we just got rid of this greater than or equal to part. Any questions? No? No? Sure that they have it in a nicer form here. Factor it, set equal to zero. Yep, that was the first answer we got. For the other one, same answer we got, from negative three to positive three. And finally, same thing for the last one must be strictly greater than negative 1, which we can also write this way as negative 1 to infinity. Good. Okay, so that's a good way to stop. I'm, a, I'm over by a little bit. Uh, so it's a good place to stop. We're almost done with section 1 in chapter 2. Uh, and we'll pick up on this tomorrow. As I said earlier, uh, because we didn't have class Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday, yeah, yes, yesterday, no, day before yesterday, today's Wednesday. Um, anyway, so I will also have class on Friday, so keep that in mind. Uh, I know some of you guys won't be able to join me, but uh, like I said, uh, everything's being recorded and posted, so we'll make up for it uh, and post it online. Okay, any questions? I, um, I have a question about how the test is going to be. How the test no. is going to be, yes. So it'll be, first of all, the content will be very similar to your homework. I can promise you that. So make sure you follow the homework, you know the homework. It's the same style of questions. Um, I, I try and come up with questions that are not identical to the homework, so they won't be identical to the homework. But if you do the homework, it should be uh, enough to be able to do the questions on the test. Now, as far as the format of how the test is going to be given, um, so I'm aiming for it to be like, let, let's say, next Tuesday. Uh, so I will make it available. Um, uh, well, just because it's summertime, mm, mm, you're, mm, mm. Um, yeah, so um, I'll make it available, say, at when class is over next Tuesday uh, at 11. I'll post it on Canvas, uh, and I'll give you guys. I'll probably I'll just give you 24 hours to get it. Well, not 24 hours because it's by the next morning before class starts at 8 a.m. Uh, so you have all day Tuesday and night um, until the next day at 8 a.m. Uh, to complete it. You have to show all your work, write it all out, um, and then you take pictures of it with your phone. Uh, and uh, come up, use an app to combine them all into a PDF file. The app that I recommended was uh, Genius Scan. Genius Scan. But there's a lot of them out there. Uh, mine was free, so hopefully you find a, a good one that's free. Anyway, you take pictures of it, um, and the Genius Scan one allows you to uh, take several pictures and compile it into one single PDF file that you can email. Uh, to yourself from your phone. And once you have it on your laptop, then you can uh, submit it on Canvas. There'll be a little Dropbox thing on Canvas where you can submit your your exam. Did that answer your question? Um, so, so we're just going to answer the questions on paper, right? There's no Correct. like multiple choice? Um, no, there is. A, well, I haven't created it, so I I, I usually don't favor multiple choice. I, I don't know if there is a, uh, there is 
going to be or not. But but I think what you're saying is that there's no Scantron required of any kind. No. Uh, okay. So the questions will be provided uh, through Canvas. You do all your work on your own paper. Uh, we're on the honor system here. I'm 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 hoping and expecting people to work by themselves and show all their work. Uh, for that purpose, you can expect that I'll be extra meticulous about making sure you show your work. Um, so show all your steps, show all your work, uh, and then take pictures of all your work um, in a nice, neat, organized way. You know, question number one, show all your work. Question number two, show all your work. Uh, take pictures of everything, compile it into one big PDF file, and then submit that. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Good. Okay. I'll uh, see. Oh, yeah. Question? How many questions should we mentally prepare ourselves for the uh, test? Um, Ballpark. Well, let's see. Um, this should be something that takes you about two hours. That's That's the goal. Um, and it's hard to say how many questions because, you know, some questions are super easy. You know, if it's a simple, simple function and uh, evaluate this function at three, like, okay, that takes you about two minutes. I can ask a bunch of those. Or if it's a more involved question, like some of those yeah. mixed questions, mixed volume questions like we did the other, the other day or yesterday, um, you know, those can take a while. So it's hard for me to say expect seven or expect ten. Uh, but I can say expect to take about two hours. I, I'm shooting for someone who knows what they're doing uh, to take about two hours to, to do a really nice job detailing this whole thing. Because um, that's, what, that's what I would expect in a classroom setting for people to finish this. in the. We have three hours in class, so I would shoot for two hours. And then some people might take a little longer. Some people might take a little less. Um, and then that's what you submit. Okay. Sounds good. Um, as far as technology goes, um, you're obviously uh, you obviously have access to any number of technologies, including that Desmos account that I showed you. Uh, but um, uh, on by most on on all questions by default, you shouldn't you're not allowed to use the technology. Uh, you have to show all your work. Now, some of them will say use technology to 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 solve this like the graphing yeah, like ones. Calculator. So for graphing. those, you don't have to show any work. Just, you know, here's my graph. Just do like a little sketch. And then I, you know, put in the values that you get from your results. And, uh, you know, that that's the just justification for those. For all the other ones, you can use technology to confirm your work. Like, okay, I did it by hand. I got an answer of two thirds. And then you can use technology to confirm it and make sure that it all makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but you do have to show your work. So for a question where I'm expecting to see work, if all I see is the answer, I'll just assume you use technology there um, and you really wouldn't get much credit. So make sure that as you do your homework, you practice doing it by hand the way that that, that particular section kind of showed us how to do. Uh, but then you can always use technology to confirm your work and make sure that it's all consistent. Okay. Cool, any other questions? I know that I have to update the homework. I'm sorry about that. I, I will get that done today for chapter one. Yeah. Good. All right. I'll see you guys tomorrow then. Oh, sorry. Just one more oh, question. Yes. I might have mentioned this already, um, but I probably just missed it. Um, for sorry. the test, is it going to be all of chapter two or is it going to be just... It's, it's one... one and... Chapter one and uh, two. Um, let's see. Today... Okay. Wherever we stop on Friday um, I, I is where I'm shooting at. So it kind of depends on just how fast or slow we go on this thing. But it'll definitely be Chapter 2. Um, so wherever we stop on... Yeah, wherever we stop this Friday uh, will be the cutoff uh, for whatever is on our test by next Tuesday. Okay. 